I would like to open the floor now for questions and discussion. If you uh, want to raise your hand and then uh, just come on up to the mic and uh, we'll follow that format. Um, I was really excited to see this subject um, posted. Um, I actually live in the Joliet area and although I am a student here, I try to make sure I'm only here on the days that I need to be. And <laughs> today was not one of those days, but I wanted to make a special trip to be here. Well, thank you. Um, Ms. Halverson, when you made the statement earlier about the, what happened in 2010 with the reduction in women, I want to say that I wasn't surprised. Um, I'm a second year, well, first year student here at GSU, and a couple years ago I went back to school at Prairie State. I'm one of the first people in the uh, DDP program here at GSU. And part of the DDP requirement is that you go to school full time. I also work 50 hours a week. And when people found out that I was going to school full time on top of my work schedule, on top of being a parent, women were like, how? How, how, how can you possibly do this? And, you know, as I explained to them, well, you know, we make a way. In my era, that's what we did. You know, our parents, my mother, was those individuals that they didn't let things stand in their way, they made a way. And what I'm finding now in the women that I'm meeting is that women in my era have become comfortable where we're at, and we no longer see ourselves in those situations. Woman of the next era, misogyny, not even in the hip hop music, it on, went over in other genres and in the media and everywhere else now, no longer see themselves as individual that not only need to nurture in their home, change, make changes in themselves, make changes in their children, and in our sister friends in the community on what can we do to improve our lives, you know? If I'm making $10 an hour, what can I do even if I am a single working mother to make this not be my destiny? And I guess why I'm up here is that, you know, as I'm talking to other women, constantly saying, hey, you can do this too. You know, I'm going to school, I figured out how to manage my schedule. How do I take it to another level to make sure that, you know, all my sister girls <laughs> know that, you know, we need to be putting ourselves in these positions, because if we get comfortable, the reduction is going to continue. And what is your name again? Rafia Muhammad. Rafia, thank you so much for asking that question. And it is so true. And, and let me uh, mention a couple things first. Women do not toot their own horn. Number one problem. How is anybody going to know what you do if you don't tell them? Mm -hmm. I raised two children. Um, I was a single mom. I put them through college at the same time I came back here. I got my bachelor's and my master's degree while I was putting them through college, and I was a state senator at the time. They could never complain that they were too busy. <laughs> you do it. But somehow we women don't complain about it. We just do it. But we never talk about it. We've got to do something to where we talk about it. That's another reason women don't move up. Men don't have a trouble. And you know what? I love you guys. And all you secure men, thank you for being here. <laughs> I hope you're getting extra credit. So, you know, men don't have, first of all, women need to be asked to run for office. Men just do it. Women want to do something, men want to be somebody. You, you, it, it's just the way it is. I'm sorry to say that, but men learn as they're growing up. You go fight, you go play sports, you hate the person you're fighting against, but you're friends when you leave. Women mm -hmm. play one on one mm -hmm. very nicely, you don't get dirty, mm -hmm. and God forbid you should have a fight because you're still mad a month later. <laughs> We've got to learn different ways to be able to do things. We not only have to tell each other or tell people what we've done, because we don't, because we need to get that promotion. And, and not only here in politics, but we're here to talk about politics. But when you're in the business world, no boss is going to promote you by you thinking, I hope they see what I did today. They're not going to. But we need to make sure people know what we've done. They need to know. And women, if you don't learn how to do confrontation, you ain't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Confrontation is not a bad word. 
that's discourse. And I tell people, do not give up your power to avoid discourse. We do it every day. We walk away every day because we don't want to upset somebody. We don't want to get in the middle of a problem. We don't want to argue. So we avoid discourse. And guess what? You go nowhere. Until women realize that discourse is a good thing or confrontation is a good thing because confrontation can be a win-win if you do it right. But women don't realize that you don't take it personally because you go and you talk about something, you're going to learn from it and you're going to do something good about it. But our kids, I have a daughter who's now almost 31. She understands that she can't quit. But our kids, our kids are comfortable. We did all the hard work. <laughs> now they're comfortable. They said, ah, we've got Roe versus Wade, we got this. But Roe v. Wade, it's on the assault mm -hmm. every day. We have got to do something to instill in our next generation to do something about making sure that they stay in front of it all. But we, this generation, did too good of a job and the generation before us of fighting that fight so that our kids, we don't want our kids to have to do any hard work. And look what happened. Now they're comfortable. So, you know, we've got to toot our own horn, realize confrontation is not bad. It's a good thing. And realize that there are barriers out there that are stopping women from doing things. First of all, not everybody's going to be asked to run for office. I had to be asked many times, and I kept saying, you're nuts. The Kemps are here, they know, in 1996 when I was deciding to run for state senate. But you got to do it. You got it. Women have got to step forward. But the other thing is we were being discussed, and that's why I did not take much time up in the beginning, because I knew as these questions came, I would be able to expound on some of these issues that came up. We have got to realize there should not be a perception of difference between women and men. We all bring something to the table, and we all can do a good job. We just do it a little differently, and it's not a bad thing. But as soon as women realize that you must take a risk, don't be afraid to lose. Don't be afraid to fail. People do it all the time. Pick yourself up, brush yourself off. Tomorrow's a new day. If I was afraid to fail, you know where I, I'd never been anywhere. So keep moving, talk about what you do, don't afraid, be afraid of confrontation, and take some risks. And I think that that's going to be what we women need to do as we move forward. And don't be afraid of confrontation or that discourse. We give power away every day to avoid discourse. Don't do it. I'd like to just piggyback a little bit on that. Um, I think I was having an earlier discussion today about how, you know, women back in the 60s and the 70s really struggled with women's rights. And there were so many things that we weren't allowed to do and that society said we couldn't do and we were the fairer sex and we were the weaker sex and et cetera, et cetera. And if you wanted to pursue anything in business or in politics, you really had to have somewhat of a tough persona Otherwise, you were going to get knocked down. I mean, uh, look at Geraldine Ferraro, for example. I mean, she would have never run for vice presidency if she wasn't a tough chick. The point being, women in our previous generations worked so hard to just get us to where we are now. And yet, for some reason, we've all let it go as if it doesn't need nurturing. And one of the things in my research that I was appalled by was the lack of outrage by women and women's groups about what's being said and done about women. Why aren't people angry? Well, I hope I have a chance to discuss that with someone else, and I because I can tell you why. <laughs> but I'm not going to take right. that time. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to take somebody else's time. So I'm going to let you ask your question. Okay, sure. Um, I'd love to introduce into this conversation um, one of the most effective and powerful tools in the 21st century, which is technology and the use of technology um, and, and the power that it provides 
uh, for the voice of women. Maybe a couple of months ago, you guys remember that on uh, uh, about three women got together and said, look, we want to see a woman moderate um, the, the, yes, the debates. And so three women got on a website called change.org and they said, look, I want all of my sisters and brothers who agree that a woman should have a role in, the, in moderating this discussion to get involved and to, to support this and say that this should happen. They did. They got the number of people that they needed to say that this should happen. And guess what? It happened. Um, so I think one of the things that that example illustrates is that we have to speak out and we have to use the mediums that exist today to speak out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Thank point. you. Good point. Good point. Hello, and thank you all for coming tonight. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I have a question. Um, I am the type of woman I've always, I've known education is the key. Education is the key. I went to school, I got my undergrad, I got my grad, I have my PhD. I want to run for office. I really, really want to run for <laughs> office. I've been asked to run for office, but it's like when I get there, and I'm very confrontational. I, I mean, well, you don't want to be too. I'm not too confrontational. Yeah. Okay. I know how to stay professional. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is, some of my concerns when I try to get people on board with, okay, this is an issue. This is an issue in our community, and I get them on board. But then, when it's time to do, let's go roll this out, you don't get that support. So, how do you keep your support going? Is that a question for me? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what's your name? Uh, Quintella Bounds. Quintella, thank you so much for being here. Um, volunteers and help is very difficult. Very difficult because people are busy. You have to find, it's a what's in it for me. People have got to see that there's in it something in it for them. That there's a reason you get them involved. There's a reason... Um, when, in 1996, when I ran, I mean, uh, I beat a 17-year-old, seven, not a 17-year-old, 17-year entrenched um, incumbent who had been there a long time and was not a friend of the area, but nobody could ever beat him or would run against him. I had a huge, as um, the Kemps who are sitting here, I'm, I hope I don't have to keep referring to you, but they worked very hard day and night um, because there was something in it for them. They wanted to get rid of a person that was not good for the area. Whatever it is you run for, you need to find other people who are interested in what you're doing. It is very difficult now to find people who are, you know, but also, like we're talking about the media, there are so many new things out there, though, that can help you, you know, get the word out and to do things. Um, but I do want to also mention, we as women have to walk a very fine line. We have to pick our fights wisely. We have to ignore a lot of things that are said to us, unfortunately, um, because it's just the way it is. Ladies, we got to just suck it up. I shouldn't have said that word, but I don't, can't think of another word to say. <laughs> but, you know, it's because there are going to be things that, since there are, we are so few women in the business, we aren't all there to make the rules. There are a lot of unwritten rules that are written by males because males bond with men. Sure. They get to write the rules. It's the way it is. So when we pick our fights wisely because when I pick a fight, I'm going to win it. So I'm not going to pick a fight that I'm not sure I can win because campaigns are long, costly, and nasty. And I am going to win a fight that, you know, I'm not going to win the war. I could win a battle, you know. But when you're, and please, I don't want to take everybody's time. If you're interested, you know what, I'll give you my email or whatever. And I'll help, I want to help whatever, whoever, women, whatever woman, whoever, whatever you want to run for. That's what I want to do now is help whoever it is that want to get somewhere. Uh, I wrote a book. It should be out November 1st. Um, it, it was very hard for me to write. I mean, it's, it's called Playing Ball with the Big Boys. So if you go to playingballwiththebigboys.com, you can pre-order the book. You can see the toll table contents is um, on the website. 
it was very difficult to write my story because I'm one of these practical pers people that said, okay, this is what needs to be done. Let me tell you how to do it, and let's just do it. But to have to write my story and tell people about me, that was really rough. You and whoever else wants to run for office, you just let me know because I want to be there to help. But remember to pick your fights wisely and get some other people around you that want to help you because of you. Mm -hmm. That's how you get volunteers. But, but just to follow up on that, I was, sorry. I, I mean, and I want people to get into dialogue here, so don't feel mm -hmm. free to speak up and everything if you have yeah, other points of views. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, 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 I hear, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that one of the things that you're facing, and I think this is a societal and culture, yes. cultural issue, mm -hmm. is general apathy in our society towards anything. I mean, look at how difficult it is to get people to vote. What is the percentage of people that are eligible to vote that actually go to the polls? Uh, Debbie, do you know that? It's about 20% in the primaries. Um, and on a good year in 08, when um, Barack ran, it was very high. Um, we're hoping, it, but maybe But 40, still, 50%, 50, maybe? 50, 40 or 50. OK. They, they, they cancel elections in other countries if they only get 80% of the vote out. Right. They cancel right. the election and make you do it again. Mm. Right. So I think that there's this sense of general apathy in our society that we need to tackle. And, and, and to get people on board with you, I think you have to find what their passion is. What would get them fired up and get them fired up? And I think that is where you'll get your commitment. Yeah, and can I just jump in with a little sort of brass tacks uh, advice? I've, I've done a political campaign uh, in, in the past. I've worked on winning campaigns and a lot of losing campaigns. <laughs> Everybody starts at the beginning. Every candidate will lose, likely, their first campaign. And that's OK. The kinds of experiences that you will gain being in your first campaign are important to building that next run. And you know, if you run a campaign with your friends and your family out of your basement, good, do it. Yes. Start at the beginning, take a look at what other folks are doing. You're gonna have natural affinity with those who share uh, the same issues that are important to you. So those are the people right away in your community that you're trying to connect with. They may be your friends, they may be your family, they may be your coworkers. Start there. Try to find associations and organizations, not only that share your, your view, but give you the opportunity to stand up and to talk, which is another way to start reaching out really intimate face-to-face. -face. You start there, and then you figure out where's the best place for you to have your first campaign and take your first run. That's great. We're gonna get to your question. I wanted to ask Debbie mm -hmm. Halverson a question. Sure. You mentioned tank it, women taking risks. Mm -hmm. When they do run their first race, if it is not a successful race, do they lose any amount of credibility when they're trying to get people on board for the next run? Do they, is the, is the apathy there? Is it present? Do people feel like, well, I'm not gonna jump on this bandwagon again because they weren't successful in the first, in the first run? Do or do they get excited about you trying again and do they garner that excitement within the political party that you're running for? I just wanted to know what happens between the two runs. Well, I guess I can't speak for everybody, but it depends on you'll lose some people because okay. some people weren't in it because of you. They were in it because of an issue. Okay. And if that issue is gone, they're gone. Mm -hmm. But if they're in it because of you and they're in it because they want to see you succeed, they will be there for you again. Um, I lost in 2010, and people really, really were so excited. They, they still want me. I, I'm like, uh -uh, I'm done. <laughs> they don't care if I lost. Mm -hmm. um, so they'll be with you um, no matter what, but you're still going to lose the people who are only there because of an issue. But if they're with you because of you, they'll still be there. Okay, great. Hi, my name's Jennifer. Um, I was listening to you saying about how you have to fight and cause riffraff if like, you're not getting your way. Well, my husband served up to eight years in the US military for the Marine Corps, and he was medically discharged two months shy. So they offer a post 9-11 bill, but in order for me to get my education paid for, he had to serve 10 years. 
And since he was medically discharged. 10 years. Yeah, for in order for the wife to get the. Oh, the, wife, the okay, so okay. W since he was, he was gonna be a lifer, since he didn't get the opportunity due to loading a bomb on a plane and breaking his back, I wrote to Congress and everybody else, sorry, I'm nervous. And they keep writing back to me like, sorry, you have to do 10 years. Then when I talked to the Congress people in California, when I went to the Soldiers Project meeting, they said like only in certain situations, special situations, can you get that post 9-11 transferred. But when I write to the Pentagon twice and my husband writes twice and we get um, letters back saying you can't do anything about it, who else can you talk to? Um, who, you know what, I'll give you my card. I can't help because I'm not there anymore, but I will help you find a person to talk to because that's ridiculous. I mean, there's got to be, if you're getting these, I mean, it's like people calling the IRS and getting 20 different answers right. for 20 different people. I was on the Veterans Affairs Committee, and I remember helping people that, and on I mean, I had a Veterans Affairs caseworker who was able to help so many people. Uh, we'll have to find out who we can get you to talk to. And on top of that, like most of the wives that I do talk to that are trying to get an education, since it's such a transient area, like the military to be a military family, it's like you go from one school to another right. to right. another, and nothing transfers. Where do you live? Now we live in Chicago. We are based in California and just everywhere. It's like. Okay. See me or I'll get you, get me your information. I'll see what I could do. Okay. Thank you. And take a deep breath. You did great. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening. Hey, how are you? Hi, how you doing? I said I wasn't going to say anything, but. Oh, I'm glad you are. Yeah. <laughs> We know each other. But uh, what I wanted to say is you got to have attitude. Women, we got to have attitude. I don't mean a bad attitude. I mean the good attitude. Attitude is like we make men. Well, tell them what organization you belong to. I mean, they should all belong. Uh, I'm the immediate ex-president of the League of Women Voters for the Park Forest area, which encompasses 13 communities. And I only stepped down so I could help Barack. And so anyway, with legal women voters, help. ladies, legal women voters, that's a good one. The, okay. It's a good organization to join, and what I want to say to you is, I know your name, but I've never met your face, but at any rate, organizations will help, right? Mm -hmm. You need to belong to organizations. Those are the first things. Mm -hmm. And it, if you first you don't win, you get up and pick yourself up. I have a lot of respect for a, a woman that did not win. Than, uh, as opposed to one maybe that walked in. Because if you didn't win and she only got maybe 20% of the vote, that's a tough woman. It takes a tough woman or person, is even tougher, female, to even run. Kid that. Now, it takes toughness to even run. And stop fighting wars and fight a bat. You know, fight, fight the whole war, not just a battle. If you end it to win it, People will follow you. Some will fall off, but they'll come back. And remember, there are 24 hours in the day. Decide how many you want to take. I've taken a lot today, and I'm still here, and I'm an old grandmother. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, panelists. Thank you for being here. I'm Cherie Sanderson, and I'm going to ask that tough question. Um, as I was listening, especially with Professor James, I am a fan as well of Rachel Maddow. I can't get enough of her. Uh, but my question is, is that in, the, in what is happening in the 21st century to women, I can't believe that we are sitting idly by and not taking any action. We've just thrown down the gauntlet and sat on top of it. So what my question is, Debbie, now um, you can answer. That's right. Why aren't we getting involved? We should be completely outraged that our rights are trying to be taken away from us. Thank you. Thank you for, for bringing me back. <laughs> it's very frustrating. L let me go back. It's kind of a, not a real long story, but I was the first woman ever in the history of Illinois to serve as the Senate Majority Leader. 
So which put me in a precarious position because now I uh, had to be on committees. I was the only female on our executive committee. Uh, there were no Republican women in leadership. It was just me. Phyllis Schlafly came to speak against the ERA. Because, you know, Illinois was one of the states that did not ratify the ERA back in the day. So it fell short by, I think, three states. So we in Illinois, I kind of led the charge. I wanted to, to revisit it to see if we can, you know, ratify the ERA. I mean, why shouldn't we? Well, Phyllis Schlafly, of all people, Miss Anti-ERA, came to speak. And uh, she had many of her minions with her, and um, her bun still looks the same. I don't think she ever took it down. <laughs> God knows I'd hate to see what's underneath there. So she um, came and was speaking about all these reasons why women should not be on, um, we should not be ratifying or be speaking about the ERA. Several of my Democrat male colleagues agreed with her. I, I was shocked that we should not be having women on the front lines, and there was just all these other reasons why we should not be. So I took it upon myself after that day to put a group of women together and say, we need to be outraged. We need to be having a fit about this. This is ridiculous. I mean, granted, I was the only woman, and I could only say so much. So I got these group of women together, and we tried to get things going. They were outraged. What I found out was women are envious of other women. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. mm -hmm. We are our own worst enemies. Yes. Yes. When is this going to stop? Mm -hmm. We are our own worst enemies. It's like women are afraid that there's only room for one yes. at the top. So God knows we shouldn't help another person up there because that might take their spot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have got to realize that there is room at the top for everybody. We need to stand at the top of the ladder with our hand out, helping every single woman up that ladder. And until we do, what it, I think it's Mark, Mark um, Mad, Madeline Albright who says, there is a place saved in H-E-L-L -L, for any woman who doesn't help another woman. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. But the outrage needs to be there that women need to help other women. We are our own worst enemies. So what we have found as we talk to other women is they don't want to help another woman because they're afraid that would shortchange them. So we have to change ourselves. So my, what I've been trying to tell people is we need to change what's in us mm -hmm. before we can change mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. When you point at one person, three fingers are pointing back at you. So I have been on this mission to teach other women that there is room at the top for everybody and not to be envious or... So that's what has frustrated me so much and, and, you know, and how I've been trying to tell other women that we should not be each other's own worst enemy and that's what stopped our progress. Elected officials have dropped off for women because of this. Local office elected women dropped off by half. There are half as many women in local office now as there were before. You know, so anyway, that's what's been happening. So I want to just challenge each and every one of you women to talk about helping other women and find out what they say. Find out how they feel about helping other women and see if you can find it. And here's the other thing I, I challenge you. When you are at work or school and you hear one woman try to gossip or talk about another one, mm -hmm. you walk away. Mm -hmm. Do not participate in gossip. Yeah. Yeah. I know this is about politics and discourse, but this is where it starts. If we don't stop this bickering mm -hmm. amongst each other, what has a, given me the ability to go where I have all these years is because I said, you're going to talk about this person? Let me call her up. Let me go get her. Mm -hmm. Let me put her in this room because I'm not going to listen to this unless she's right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But unless everybody's going to do it, it's not going to work. That's the outrage. That's what we have to hear. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way to fix some of these things. But it's going to take all of us. It begins, with it us. begins right here with each and every one of us.
And until we start helping other women and start changing us, the outrage is not going to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to add that I think a large part of the apathy that I've witnessed, and I've just done a lot of service learning, uh, which for the teachers who are in the class, uh, who are in our audience here, uh, and professors, uh, you know, service learning is a great way to get your students excited again. Mm -hmm. They haven't been excited about anything in so long right. mm -hmm. that giving them an opportunity to do so really changes their lives. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my first point. My second point is. One of the reasons for the apathy that I see, especially in the classroom, is they're not informed. Mm -hmm. People are simply not informed. They're not engaged. How many of you read a newspaper every day? Mm -hmm. How many of you watch the news? Mm -hmm. how, much, uh, how many of you um, get involved in what's happening in your local community? One of the projects I did uh, in a service learning uh, project was I had my students research nonprofit organizations in their communities because they literally said they don't really know their communities. They drive in their garages and out of their garages, and that's the extent of their community. They weren't even aware of how needy most communities are right now. I mean, I'm sure you've witnessed a huge down, uh, downfall in funds available for community service and needs. So they'll come to me and they'll say, oh my God, I had no idea. And I think that that's what's happening. Because how else could you listen to a comment by Rush Limbaugh or Todd Aiken and not want to scream? I think we need to become better informed and I think we need to be better engaged. And I think the last part is we need to become a community again. We need to care about each other. We need to want to see each other succeed. And we need to support each other. Good evening. Um, I've really enjoyed um, this dialogue um, this evening. My name is Crystal Blunt. I teach in the psychology program. And uh, one thing that we did circle back to was this idea that the very wealthy are uh, living on a different planet. So uh, I happen to be one of those people that's on Facebook and that's very vocal. I enjoy political discourse. And I have been looking for a really good argument. I think this applies to the women's rights issue as well. What do you say to people who clearly have never been wealthy, will never be wealthy, that seem to think that this idea is a good idea, that we shouldn't, that, that, that wealthy people are not receiving entitlements? that somehow that's not an entitlement to have this legal tax credit. So I'm just interested because I know um, I have students in psychology here and we talk a lot about critical thinking and how to be engaged in dialogue with people who have opposite viewpoints and think and, and that's one I've really struggled with and uh, anything else you could share on how to engage in your everyday circle in political discourse from a student or faculty perspective. I'd really love to hear your suggestions for that. Well, this just happens to be one of my major research areas, but um, I think it's very simple. I mean, we have to contest all the distortions and the lies out there by mainstream corporate-owned, transnational corporate-owned media. The first point, um, you know, the idea that wealthy people are just wonderful citizens and they do such wonderful work. I mean, we should be outraged about, I mean, you know, I've been studying this for 20, 30 years now, and the more I learn about wealth inequalities, it just makes me angry. And the fact that we, we don't know about that. The comment by the candidate, or some candidate a few weeks ago, who said that the average middle income is two hundred to $250,000. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I, I mean, choke on my Wheaties. Uh, I mean, but, and, and the fact that well, I mean, we can just go on and on, but there's just so much evidence out there. And again, let's, let's exchange emails. We'll, I'll get some, send some stuff to you. But another example of that is, you know, there's been such an attack on the idea that we should help each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about that. And, and welfare is the first one. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, I mean, first of all, anybody could be on welfare at any time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone could be injured. Anybody yeah, could need sure assistance is. at any time. It doesn't matter how strong you are. I mean, he was just one, one, one interesting digression here. Professional football players at one time, and we think of them as being the strongest people on the planet, mm -hmm. 
But what happens when Junior Seau kills himself? Because of the unknown injuries, because of that violent game that destroys people mentally, physically, financially, every sort of way. But it's our national pastime. Mm -hmm. We like to see them beat the hell out of each other, you know, even though they're going to die 20, 30 years younger than anybody else. So we have to contest facts. The fact is that football is an extremely brutal game and people die from it very early. Similarly, we have to contest the fact that wealth, many people accumulate wealth not because they're independent. First of all, most wealth is accumulated because they inherited it. And then secondly, a lot of wealth is accumulated because they use the infrastructure that we, the public, paid for. And that's how they get wealth. I mean, how the hell has Dick Cheney become a multimillionaire? I mean, how, how, we pay for Dick Cheney's heart attack, for his multiple heart attacks and his heart transplant. But, you know, and he has, he has, excellent, pub he has excellent publicly funded health care, but he doesn't want that for the rest of us. And so, the, and, and this, this you find across the board, the vast majority of wealth created now, as historically has been because they have capitalized on public infrastructure. I'm from Southern California and suburban Los Angeles, and it's, it's, this is, uh, I realize this much later on, but you know, uh, a lot of the fast food enterprises that are national, even international now, were created sort of in the area just 20, 30 miles east of me, McDonald's, Taco Bell, excellent food. Um, <laughs> but that enterprise, that industry, the fast food industry grew primarily because the infrastructure that we, the taxpayer, payers paid for, interstate highway system. What would McDonald's and all those places be without the interstate highway system? You know, and the point is that, you know, they, they became gargantuanly, uh, 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 obscenely wealthy because of our investment in them. And the thing is that all of our well-being, I mean, everyone who is associated with the public institution, uh, whether it be public gra grammar school, high school, college, or whatever, we got there because someone help, helped us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went to uh, public institutions from grade school through uh, PhD and even post-doctorate. Post and, you know, uh, I think a generation of people, you know, who were beneficiaries of public education, we have to defend public education. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, at all levels. And this is no question. And so I think that, you know, we have to connect wealth anybody's wealth, everybody's wealth, with what we, the public, did for that, and, and, and to, you know, to dismiss this idea that I'm a self-made man. And I would just, uh, you know, like to, to sort of carry on from there. But one of the most dangerous things that we can do as women, as people who aren't part of the wealthy, is to organize. Mm -hmm. uh, the labor movement has taught us quite a bit about organizing. It has been very successful. We can see it on a bit of a decline now because people aren't showing up. As women, as, as groups, with our friends, with the people we care about, we have to show up. Whether we're showing up at work or showing up in our community. We have to be there, we have to be, we have to stand, we have to be counted. So I realize that there's a lot of cynicism in the political process, so be it. But people, and particularly young people all over the world, are dying to vote. It, is, it behooves us to show up and be counted. So let's rock the vote. <laughs> Hello, my name is Eva Brown. I'm a student here at Governor State. I was really happy to hear you say uh, that women are their own worst enemy because my biggest concern has been that we still living out the ideologies and stereotypes concerning women, yes. even today, yes. especially in the media. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my biggest concerns, especially for younger, younger women today, mm -hmm. that they, they even perpetuate mm -hmm. that stereotype themselves, mm -hmm. you know, yes. and carry it on. Mm -hmm. As we also discussed with Professor James and uh, women in the media. But I really enjoyed your panel discussion today and I really got a lot of information out of it, and I thank you. Thank you. You know, just let me pose this question to any of you who want to answer it. Would this continue if we didn't allow it? I think that we also, I think Eva brought up a good point, though. Most of the stereotypes are perpetuated by women. We think of ourselves in this certain role and category and we can't move out of that. We look at Debbie Halverson as an anomaly of what a woman should be, the epitome. She, has, she does things that 
we can never imagine doing, we need to change our mindsets. Everybody can do it. We need to change our mindsets. We are stuck in this one category. We're stuck in the lower levels of what women are represented in today's society, and we can't move beyond that. So when we see people like Debbie and other people that are working on these boards and advocating for different rights, we think of them as doing something extraordinary that we could never accomplish on our own. But I always, my mind while I was sitting here, it went back to um, um, Amber Alert and how one woman was mm -hmm. instrumental in making change in the United States when she lost her child. One woman's voice and the advocacy groups that are formed in other countries, they band together and I think that's what's missing so much in American society is that we don't have the unification. We don't band together as women. And I'm, I'm so glad that um, Keisha introduced the uh, technology because more people are making changes through blogs, mm -hmm. which are very easy to set up. And because we don't have a lot of time, we can utilize technology to get our voice out, to bring together people, empower other women as a whole. I'd just like to say a couple of things. Um, I've always wondered why people don't vote. And some of the attitudes are, I think we really have to get a dialogue going among our friends, coworkers, family, because those statistics are really scary. Mm -hmm. One reason is, is they say, well, I'm not a taxpayer. I rent a right. <laughs> How many landlords out there, that's the reason they raise your rent, because taxes went up. You pay taxes. Bring up some of these ideas to your friends. The other thing is, is people say, well, I really don't like to get involved in politics, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? You're an American. Just because you're an American, you are in politics. <laughs> and this country was really founded on a lot of anger. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I would encourage everybody to get out there and talk about it. Thank you. Well, and I have a saying that, you know, a lot of people have already heard me say is, if you don't do politics, politics will be done to you. Yeah. Politics is being done to you. And especially with the Supreme Court decision of C Citizens United, there is more money out there, and you haven't seen anything yet. And Illinois is being spared because they've already written it off as Obama territory. Uh, but you're still going to see it. And that was and I'm not blaming anybody but myself for my loss, but I was so outspent. I couldn't keep up with anything because the money just poured in because now businesses and anybody can spend any amount of money and they don't even have to tell you where it's coming from. So we have got to, if nothing else, if we can't afford the money, we can at least go vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, that's one thing we've got. And I always used to say, I maybe will be outspent, but I'll never be outworked. We have that going for us, is, you know, we, at least we could do is go vote. And I know the excitement maybe isn't there like it was four years ago, but it should be. The excitement better be there because I can't tell you how hard we worked at least for two years of passing all this good stuff, and maybe some people think it wasn't good stuff, but there was a lot of good stuff we did for the people when Barack Obama took office in 2008. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you something. If we don't get excited about doing something about making sure he stays there, mm -hmm. those of you who want him to stay there, he, you got to do something about you keeping him vote. there. You have to vote. So you have to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, so all I'm saying is if you don't do politics, politics will be done to you. Just a... Uh Just to expand on a couple of themes that have been brought up, particularly the idea that uh, women oftentimes don't assist each other. Um, I think one of the things we have to address in terms of mainstream media is that they tend to, and, and the right wing in general, they tend to sexualize women. Mm -hmm. That is, women are constructed as sexual mm -hmm. beings, mm -hmm. only as sexual beings. And so therefore, the, the uh, Rush Limbaugh's comments or the opposition to Sandra Fluke in terms of you know, sexualizing that. Uh, is, women can somehow somehow seem as again that you know they're primarily sexual beings. I mean, this is par this parallels. I mean, disc uh, discriminatory practices that have followed every group. I mean, every ethnic group that came to this country, mm -hmm. uh, whether they be Italians, uh, 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 Irish, uh, certainly African Americans, Latinos have, have have had to fight against these stereotypes. Um, one of the things about the the, the, the sexualization of women is that it tends to uh, 
someone alluded to earlier, you know, that, that many young women of the younger generation embrace the stereotypes and even embellish the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've, the cable TV is full of those programs that mm -hmm. tend to just, you know, what is it? All these so something wife shows, NBA, the, the housewives, NBA wives, the yeah, house, yeah, yeah. Oh my that is, God, <laughs> that is really <laughs> Jersey Shore terrible. and others. I mean, Ooh, but yeah. that that's the stuff of cable television. Yeah. But the the point is, you know, is this sort of again sexualization of women, as if that's what women are. They are essentially sexual beings, and and therefore that that has to be controlled mm -hmm. from from the perspective of the right wing. Women's sexuality has to be controlled. So that's why all this information all this focus on uh, overturning Roe v. Wade, mm -hmm. all this focus on denying birth control, all this focus on, you know, uh, no abortion, even in cases of rape. I mean, this stuff is just, just absolutely just ridiculous. And I think that, 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 that this, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the state of Washington, where I lived some years ago, a few months ago, they passed their marriage, equa uh, marriage equality law. And there were two Republican legislators who voted for it. One of them was a Republican legislator named Maureen Walsh. And in explaining her support for marriage equality and disdain for her colleagues who would not support it, she said, she said that she just lost her husband of 30 years, some, a few years before. And she said this was you know, the man who was her soulmate. I mean, they'd been together for all these years. They produced children. And she said, you know what? I actually think about all our, years to, our wonderful years together. I don't think about sex. You know, there was so much more than sex. Right. She said, I think about this fact that we could talk. We had all this relationship together. But somehow, you know, we in this country, we, get, we focus on sex. Mm -hmm. You know, this sort of sense. And women, is, and, and that's especially when, we, when it comes to women. We sort of sexualize women. Women get used as sex objects. I mean, you've seen these children beauty pageants. Honey I mean, boo -boo. yeah. Oh my God. Uh, and the whole, I mean, so, but so women are constantly, I mean, are, are, are usually a, a a product of that overly sexualized imagination that we as society have. Because why do we use sex? Because it sells. But it also is part of the repressive process. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Nikita Max, and I go to Governor State. Um, I'm majoring in psychology. Um, earlier you spoke about how the women before us paved the way so that um, this next generation could have a pretty much an easier go at it. Um, unfortunately, this generation is, is starting to, as you would say, kind of get lazy or just a lackadaisical about the situation. So um, I have an eight-year-old, and um, kids are typically extremely outspoken and very um, opinionated. So to me, I believe that the earlier the discourse, probably the better. So. What I want to say is how early do you start to get um, your children involved with public service and understanding um, the outcomes of politics? Well, at least that's one question. Well, I'll answer the service part of it. As far as I'm concerned, service starts from the day you're born. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a lifestyle choice. Um, I think embracing, because uh, I truly don't believe from a humanistic point of view that we can make it without each other. We just can't. And so I think we need to teach um, each other as much as uh, Fabian was just saying, we need to be strong and independent and all this other stuff. I agree with that, but I also think women need to do a better job of talking oh, and reaching out uh, because we can't do everything by ourselves. So we need to be talking about supporting ourselves from a very early stage in life. And I don't think it needs to be necessarily a negative rhetoric. I, th I think a lot of times it's like, oh, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you know, all this other stuff. Um, I, I, I think it just needs to be encouraged and nurtured and fostered and everything as a lifestyle choice that you know we are all here to help each other. We're all here to um, nurture each other and uh, do the best job we can. So I'd say in the womb. And all I, and all I was going to add was find good ways. Yeah, My positive. children, from the time they were could walk, would go door to door. In fact they would say, is it time to go deliver our little Debbies? Mm -hmm. Well, that was their pamphlets. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they just find something and can't make it drudgery because my daughter, who's now 31, will never walk in another parade again in her life. <laughs> and her husband is on the Champaign City Council. So it, it is a problem. But... <laughs> 
So, but it's never too early, but I would suggest making sure that it's something that they enjoy doing, you know, to make it so that they see public service, you know, as something enjoyable. And the earlier the better, but, you know, my daughter is a little more outspoken than me, and when she was in third grade, you know, and I tried to walk a fine line and, and not, I had to learn discourse the hard way. I, I did not grow up in a political family. I, I was not meant to be a politician. Um, I came about it almost by accident. But my daughter was in third grade, and she comes bustling in the house and throws her books on the ground. And I'm like, oh, God, what happened? She goes, how could a woman be a Republican? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Stephanie, what happened? Well, I just got in an argument with my teacher. I'm like, you're in third grade. Do not argue with your teacher. So you got to be careful. That's <laughs> well, that actually goes into my second question. Um, one of the things is that um, politics has gotten extremely personal. Mm -hmm. And so they've, like, shied away from the issues and kind of got, like, you know, like sometimes the family will get involved, you know, you know, we have heard some really insulting things said about, you know, individuals. Um, how do you interact with um, those with opposing views, um, even though you all may have potentially something in common to deal with? Let's, let's figure out where we can divide it. Let's separate this, the personal from the beliefs from the feelings and look at what the facts are. And, and on those issues, we can find commonality. We uh, all live in the world. We all have uh, families that we live in, uh, things that concern us, whether it be our education, whether it be our family, whether it be our health care. And I think we can find commonalities on there. Once we establish commonalities, it's OK to disagree. It's OK to have a conversation, debate issues. Uh, but until we can sort of separate and find those, those pieces, I think uh, we, have, we can potentially have some, some difficulty relating to someone who may not share your views on particular issues. And frankly, I think it's important that we have a well-rounded group of friends and colleagues and people we, in our lives that have different views. Mm -hmm. yes, Otherwise, absolutely. how do we c continue to grow our worldview? We need to understand an opposing viewpoint. It's important because you never know when it's going to affect your influence some part of your life. Because people say, never talk politics or religion. Yeah. We've got to stop saying that. Yeah. Yeah. The, most, the healthiest thing we could do is talk about things. And one of the classes I took here was dealing with diversity. Mm -hmm. Ron Bean was the um, instructor. Mm -hmm. One thing you learn is you have more in common than you have yeah. that's not. And, and if we would stop discussing what we don't have in common and start talking about what we all have in common and start talking about the things that we maybe disagree on, we'd find out we agree on most everything. Um, but again, in my book, I talk about a lot of the unfortunate things about how personal that the elections get and how nasty. I mean, I was spit on. I was, things were thrown at me. I mean, you know, it, 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 things get personal, but we've got to get away from that. Hi, I'm Andre Merrick, a professor of history, political science. I'm interested in uh, political recruitment. So, so I'm a Latin Americanist, and um, when we think of Latin America, we think of patriarchy, um, machismo, um, that sort of stuff. But they've elected a series of uh, presidents and prime ministers who are women, uh, and the United States has yet to do so. And I, I'm wondering, uh, um, I'll give you just two examples. <clears throat> the past president in Chile and the current president in, uh, in Brazil are women. <laughs> Uh, and in both positions, they were placed into the head of the State Department and then the War Department in order to make sure that when they ran for the presidency, that nobody could make claims about them being soft, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, which is a viable political maneuver to counter uh, pre-existing gender claims about women, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, we've now, there was an article in Politico the other day, is the United States ready for a male uh, uh, head of Department of State? Right? That's a good counter question to mm -hmm. the past, or we'd ask, are we ready for a female one? Uh, um, it's pretty clear that Hillary could run in 2016. That's not my question, right? But um, that she could, and people couldn't make claims that she couldn't act on the political stage uh, dealing with foreign relations. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering uh, how the political parties now work with women to make them prepared not only to be viable politicians, but to be in leadership yeah. positions. Um, so that's my broader question. I feel really bad. I feel like I'm monopolizing no, no, here. No, no. I'm so sorry. 
Um, again, I was put in leadership early on. I was elected in 19, 1996. My first leadership role came in 1998. Um, in fact, Barack Obama was elected to the state senate also in 96, and we saw our paths go differently. He, he had different ideas. I knew early on that I wanted to help my own caucus and stay within uh, leadership to help them. And I was able to work my way up through leadership being the majority leader. I found that in the state, I wanted to make sure women were in those sort of spots. But it wasn't until I got to Congress that I realized the importance of women being in the, the positions. Nancy Pelosi, who was the Speaker of the House, really put women in the spots to make sure that they served, whether it was on the armed services, whether it was on the intelligence, uh, all those spots, she made sure she put women in, in the, them. And I was impressed by that because when I got to Congress, the first thing she did was put me on the um, steering and policy committee. Freshmen do get put on the steering and policy committee. That's the one that picks who goes on what committees, who decides um, the, the, the direction. She made sure that as women came into Congress that they did get positions like that. I really think that you're absolutely right. Until women are put in positions to have something, you can't go anywhere. And, and Hillary Clinton, having probably done an absolutely fabulous job as Secretary of State, would be very well positioned. Now, I, don't, I can't speak for the other side. I wish I could come at this as a... Uh, nonpartisan or a bipartisan person, but I don't know what they do on the other side of the aisle. But I could speak for my two years having served in Congress that Nancy Pelosi went out of her way, having served on the steering and policy committee, making sure that I knew how people did get on committees. Um, she did go out of her way to make sure if there was a way, now some of it was done on seniority and there was no way you could do things differently, but if there was a way to move women into positions like that, she did make sure. I think one of the things that the differences that we see, uh, this has perhaps been alluded to earlier, in terms of how uh, we think of women in this society, if one looks at a number of women who have uh, achieved some degree of you know, success in the political arena, you mentioned Nancy Pelosi, they seem to be women who recognize that they are women and all that that means. Unfortunately, on the other side of the ideologically, women are oftentimes uh, encouraged to don't emphasize the fact that you're a woman. So like I said, I made the sarcastic comment earlier about Sarah Palin, sort of like the extra sort of kind of macho approach. And I think that the most successful women in terms of representing women are those who, you know, who, who recognize the totality of their womanhood. Now, obviously as a male, I, I can't speak to that, but what to me what it represents is this. These are women who recognize that, you know, they've struggled and that struggle is part of who they are. I mean, Madeleine Albright, for example, uh, she was divorced uh, and raised children as a single mother. Uh, um, you know, so she, and, and there's so many women who, who, who rec you know, they, when they, they construct themselves as their political construction is, you know, what have I experienced and how do I deal with that? How do I bring that into my the construction of my, myself politically? So often men uh, construct themselves as, you know, I'm strong, very narrow, I'm strong, powerful, capable of doing this and that. And unfortunately, many women who want to emulate men do the same kinds of things. And so uh, it's almost like, uh, here's another example, parallel. Clarence Thomas, in constructing himself as a judge, <laughs> I use the word loosely, judge, one of the first things he did was say that he, 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 he refused to acknowledge that he was a beneficiary of affirmative action because that's what de dependent people do. And so part of this construction of, of Clarence Thomas, much like, what was that other guy's name a few months ago? I can't remember, the pizza guy, Herman Cain. <laughs> what those people do is to, to sort of rid themselves of any characteristics that they might assume that may appear to be soft. It's like Tammy was saying earlier. Quite often in constructing men and women, we get into this sort of hard, soft dichotomy. Well, humans don't exist in dichotomies. We're whole people. And what many of the women, uh, the Debbie was referring to, these are women who say, yes, I'm a woman, and I have dealt with this, I have dealt with that, you know, I have dealt with the totality of the human experience and what it means to, 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 to present that from a woman's perspective. And in, much, in Latin America, I uh, read a little bit about, you know, the women who succeeded in Latin America, and I think that's one of the things that they bring, that life is not just about being 
you know, anybody can start a war, but not many people can end one. Well, that's great. Thank you. And I'd like to thank my audience for your participation this evening and for coming to what I felt was a very lively discussion. I'd like to th also thank my panelists one more time. We have Debbie James. We have Donald Culverson, Representative uh, Debbie Halverson, and Tamara Wynn. And I'm Arnest Krauss. Thank you so much for joining us.